Well, this morning, as we, in the Lord's will, continue on in our study of the Synoptic Gospels, find ourselves now in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. What a blessing it is to be able to go through each chapter and to learn of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, in the 10th chapter of Matthew, and as we've read, it is directly parallel to the text in Mark, Mark 6, verse 7, and Luke 9, verse 1, at the commissioning of the twelve apostles. Now, what you have in comparison in Mark's account and in Luke's account are what we call those summary passages where we are told briefly that they went two by two and they went out given authority of the Lord to heal the sick and to cast out demons. But here in Matthew 10, which is why it is our base text this morning and will be our base text for the next couple of Lord's Days, is because it is an entire chapter dedicated to this new section that we have entered in uh, as discussed last Lord's Day. Remember, the focus of our study in the synoptics, whether it was chapter 7, 8, and 9, was the demonstration of Christ's power to prove that He indeed is Messiah uh, in the sight of the Gentiles and in the sight of the Jews. But more so to prove to His disciples that He indeed is God sent and that He indeed is that Messiah sent of the Father. As we enter chapter 10, and really the latter of chapter 9, we enter a new section which is now focused on the very training ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not only in His ministry there to heal, to sick, and to teach in the synagogues, but there also present with His disciples to disciple them. And this is an important section for all believers, we who are His disciples, for all Christians are disciples, and a very important section for us to hear and listen, to be corrected, to learn from the very lips of our Savior the same words that He taught the disciples of old. Discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to be a Christian? For many, Christianity is just all about coming to church every Sunday. For some, it's all about knowing John 3.16. Others, it is to be social media warriors and going out and posting verses and quotes. But what does it truly mean to be a follower of Christ? And that's why I'm so excited because over the next couple of Sundays, a lot of Sundays actually, we will be in Matthew 10, a chapter that is specifically dedicated to the instruction given of our Lord to the disciples and how they must view themselves as His disciples. And as we go through this together, we will learn a lot about discipleship, uh, of the advancement of the kingdom of God, and not so much only the discipleship example found in these disciples, but discipleship for ourselves. What does it mean for me to be a disciple? And what does it mean to disciple others? How are we to be discipled? And how are we to disciple others? That's what we will learn throughout this study of Matthew 10. And in this chapter, we see the very direction of the Christian call. The Christian call is not just professing and believing. The Christian call includes the very working of the Holy Spirit in moving the man to good works. Remember, the Apostle Paul says that we are the worksmanship of Jesus Christ, created for good works. Good works are not bad. Good works are a result of our conversion. That is, if we have been converted. Good works apart from salvation is just good works in vain. But true conversion should lead a man to genuine works or to good works, the works of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this chapter, we see the direction of true conversion. We see their calling to believe on the Lord Jesus, and then we see their genuine following of Him wherever He went. And now, we see their training, the training of the twelve disciples. Before we can get to the book of Acts, there was a lot of difficulties the Lord had to overcome when it came to managing His disciples. And that's the period of training that we are in now. 
Every Christian has to be trained. Every disciple has to be trained. They cannot be called a disciple unless they are willing to be trained and are under one who trains them. And this is the order that we have found in Scripture. The Lord has now taken us to a section where He's training His disciples, preparing them for the harvest. Now remember, at the end of Matthew chapter 9, the Lord Jesus looked upon the crowds. And He looked upon them with eyes of compassion. The Scripture says compassion, which is to tell us that He participated in their sufferings. He felt the pain of the lost. And He told His disciples to pray for there the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Hence, pray to the Lord of the harvest that He may send laborers. And what did it mean when the Lord said, the harvest is plentiful? Well, He saw that there was many who were lost. All of the people running to Him were lost, but He had judgment in mind. He knew that the day of judgment was coming to either preserve the wheat or burn the terror. The day of judgment approaches where men will either be burned or barned, where people will either be sent to, condemn, to final condemnation or to eternal bliss where God brings them into that everlasting glorious life with Him forever. And so the Lord Jesus, when looking upon the crowds with compassion, had their eternal state in mind. And I ask you this morning, after hearing what we heard last Lord's Day morning, how have you been through the week when you look upon a man, when you look upon your neighbors? Have you looked upon them with compassion? Do you participate in their sufferings as lost men and women? Do you sympathize as the Lord Jesus sympathized or had sympathy for us? He had compassion over the lost which is why out of his compassion and out of his brilliance, his wisdom, in the Lord's will, he would call his disciples to be those ones that the Father had sent as those labor, uh, laborers. So he instructs them to pray, to pray that they would see that God is sending workers for the proclamation of the gospel. Now those very same disciples that prayed were the same ones that the Lord Jesus has instructed, uh, or as I said last Lord's Day, were the same ones that He would train for the ministry. After all, remember when we talked about these 12 disciples and went over them individually back in Luke chapter 6, long, long ago, we went over each disciple at that time by names and came to recognize who they were. In Luke 6, the Lord there prayed all night showing us that the calling of men for the harvest is not just out of external sights, out of merely seeing potential in a man. The Lord prayed all night. And after He prayed all night, He chose these twelve to be His very messengers. So there is no, it's, it's no brainer, it is not a surprise to us, that these same twelve in Matthew 10 are the ones He's calling to, com to the commission of Matthew 10. And so in verse 1, you see, if with consideration of chapter 9, the beginning, he tells them to pray. But in verse 1, he calls them for preparation. And then in verse 6, he instructs them who to go to. And then in verse 7, he instructs them to proclaim the kingdom of God. And so you see the structure. Pray, calling, going and proclaiming. That's what you see from the end of Matthew 9 to the beginning of Matthew 10. Praying, calling, going, and proclaiming. That is the order of discipleship in the example that the Lord has left for us when He came to His 12 disciples. And we also see, as we consider all of those points together, in the example of the disciples, that genuine prayer for laborers must always be accompanied with personal willingness to go. You see, when they prayed, they also had it within them as the Lord would call them, right here in Matthew 10 verse 1, to come. Every person who prays for the harvest, 
laborers for the harvest, should always have a heart of personal willingness to go themselves. That's important. Compassion is what the Lord had. And so compassion is what the disciples must have also. Compassion, not unto idleness, but compassion with willingness. Amen? Compassion, not unto idleness, leading nowhere, but compassion with willingness. How many people pray for the lost, but have no willingness to preach to the lost? How many people think of their lost relatives and their lost loved ones, but have no urge inside of themselves to proclaim that gospel to their loved ones? It is dead faith. It is fruitless. It is praying to the wind without direction or without intention of the Lord's purpose in one's life. We are called to have compassion as Christ did, who acted in His compassion, not that we may be idle, but that we may be willing. Lest we come to think that the Christian life or the Christian call is merely about praying and then falling into a state where we are inactive, waiting merely for the platter of God to be served in front of us, where we pray and pray and wait until we open our eyes and see that the blessings are right in front of us. Certainly the Lord works sovereignly, and certainly the Lord will answer prayers whether you do something or you don't. But we are called in this commission not to be lazy or idle. This is a world that we live in with millions of people on their way to the place of eternal hell, damnation. We are living in a world where people die every second, where people, you and I, get weak every second. We do not know how long we will live, much more those who are lost, lost especially those who are dying without the, the Lord Jesus Christ, they will die in their sins and will forever be left into damnation. And so there is urgency. There is a great need. And there is no time, no room for idleness. There is no room for vain things. There is no time to waste. Uh, I remind you again that if we only understood the urgency of those who are lost, you will not have enough time to be playing video games, playing and watching the television. You will not have time wasting it in other things. If you understood the need of this world and the harvest that Christ is calling all of His disciples to be into, you will know that every man and every woman should use their time wisely in prayer, in meditation, of God's word, not wasting time in carnal things. And I assure you that if you continue to live in such idleness, that you may very well be those people lost that need to be evangelized. You are called his disciples. So that's why I've said to you that conversion, the direction of our call, is not into idleness. The direction of our call is to serve. Why did Jesus call us? Not only is He gracious and merciful to save an undeserving people, but He has also called us for His purpose and glory. That means our life is now meant to serve Him for the rest of our lives, our whole and total beings. Not part of ourselves, but our whole selves are meant to serve Him. And so the Christian life is not just about sitting here this morning. Why are we learning? Why are we being taught? Why has God given us the means of grace that we may feed and sorry eat of the living bread of God? Why? Is it just so that we may expand our knowledge? Is it just so that we can test things out after learning new doctrines? What is the call and purpose of God for believers after saving them? This is so important, Matthew 10. Indeed it is, as it teaches us of ourselves and when we are discipling others. We should never think that Christianity should find us in an idle state. Remember the words of James. 
uh, James chapter 2, verse 14, and then in verse 17. What does the apostle say? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Now the context there, he gives an example, and he says, what happens when your brother who's in need asks for something and all you have to say is, may God bless you? And then in verse 17, he says, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. That word dead there, another way of using, uh, seeing it is that word barren. It's no different than a barren woman who can't bear a child. Fruitless is what, is it, what it's saying. And James is saying that merely having a notion of what you ought to pray for, merely blessing people by words or uh, lip service, it's not going to do anything. It's fruitless. It has no direction. And so you can pray all you want in the context of winning the lost as it applies. It can be applied to this as well, especially the lost, where we pray to God, Lord, save those loved ones of mine who are on their way to hell. But there you are, being given the gospel of Christ. There you are every Lord's Day, listening to the preacher of the gospel, learning, taking note, and not willing to go and speak the gospel. You are no different than the one that James speaks of in chapter 2. A dead faith, a no direction, a directed life. It is valueless as you are waiting for silver platters to be placed in front of you. And so it is important for us to consider that the Christian life is about service. Have you understood that? The Christian life is about service. And I will tell you, the Christian life is about selflessness. So many men want to be preachers, and so many men want to be pastors, or in office of any sort. But they don't want to be selfless. They aren't selfless. But rather, they are selfish. They think about their convenience. They think about their gain. They think about what it's in it for them. I've heard so many times people saying to me, I, th there's no point in talking to those people because they don't want to listen anyway. I've heard so many times people say, why would I go there? It's so far. My gas is going to be wasted. What am I going to do there? I don't feel comfortable with speaking to those people. I would rather just stay home. I'd rather just do my own studying. I'd rather just do my own thing. What they don't understand is the Christian life is a life of service. It is a life of selflessness. Remember when Paul the Apostle says this in Philippians. He says, remember the Lord Jesus who did not count himself equal with God but emptied himself and became a servant. If we think the Christian life is about being a ruler over people, you are greatly mistaken. It's about being servants. That's what it is about. Remember the words of our Lord in Matthew 23. The greatest among you shall be your servant. In John 13, If I then... I love this. He doesn't just say, be humble. He says, if I, he points to himself. If I then, your Lord and teacher, two titles of great ranking and status, Lord and teacher, if I then have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. You see? How many of you have a heart to serve and yet to wash the feet of one another or another? The Lord Jesus humbled himself to the point that he took his own garment and washed the dirty feet of his own disciples to demonstrate his servanthood 
and the example that he is giving to them to, um, uh, to imitate. And so the Christian life is about service. It's not about you going home after this and calling it a day and saying, well, that's it for me. Can't wait to hear what's next next time. God has called you unto himself. And it is of our duty to seek his face and to know his will. But pastor, I don't know. Well, then seek his will. Just like the Lord Jesus sought his will, sought the Father's will, always praying, always fasting, always separating himself that he may know the will of his Father. And what does he say? My food is to do the will of my Father. Don't you know that my business is of my Father's house? And so the Christian should never see themselves any different. And so what we have in chapter 10 of Matthew is an entire chapter where our Lord prepares and equips the twelve for servanthood. You want to know what it's like to be a servant. Heed the instructions of Matthew 10. And it really all begins in verse 5 and then it just keeps moving forward from there. But today, before we get to verse 5, which is next week, we have to deal with and consider the very contents of verses 1 to 4, which are very rich, could be easily read, but in them, richness. In them, great lesson. When you consider everything else that has happened between the Lord and His disciples. And so in verse 1, we read, And He called to Him His twelve disciples. That, that alone will take the majority of our t uh, study this morning. And He called to Him His twelve disciples disciples. The first thing we are to consider in Matthew chapter 10 is the official commissioning of these 12. The official commissioning. Now, we have read in the past, in the previous chapters, specifically Mark 3 and Luke 6, when Jesus had called his disciples unto himself. You see a clear picture of this in John chapter 1. <clears throat> but the Lord had called his disciples to come and follow him. And that very first phase, he showed them his power. He taught them the mysteries of the kingdom. But here, we are finally moving into a period of training where he makes it official, their apostleship. Now, when we hear apostleship, we immediately think of a high position, a position of such maturity that we see in the Acts and in the Epistles. But I'll tell you, the first glance of apostleship is not a pretty sight. It is apostleship that is uh, comprised of weak men. And here, things are being made official. And why do I say that? Well, the word called here has the idea, and its use, the word calling here, or called, has the idea of a summoning. And a reverent summoning. This is not just, hey, come over here. This is a reverent summoning. It is an intense verb where Jesus is calling them face to face, preparing them for a serious conversation. Uh, this is compared to a captain when he calls for one of his troops and then assigning him a task. Yeah, you also see the same word used in Acts 13 when the church of Antioch uh, was being ordered by God and the Lord said that separate for me Saul and Barnabas to do the works that I have called them to do. The same word is used there. The same work that I have summoned them to commit themselves to. And so this moment in Matthew 10.1 is the moment where Christ makes their apostleship official. Not that it wasn't official then, but it is transitioning them to the position that they themselves now are doing the works of apostles or the works of, his, of, of Christ. It is 
messengers of Christ. And really, that's how we should view it, that they were not ready to build churches at this point. They were not ready to be by themselves at this point. But the word apostolos merely means messenger. Now, obviously, this has more meaning later on in their call, but they are his messengers. And he has called them his messengers who would be trained to reflect, to manifest the same power that he had when he was demonstrating his works before the crowds. And how do we know that it is made official? Because in verse 1, Matthew describes them as the 12 disciples. When you get to verse 2, the names of the 12 apostles, they are now described as those 12 apostles. Which is, again, to make official their position as those called of God, called of Christ, to advance His kingdom while He was on the earth. Now, prior to the official sending, these were known as disciples in verse 1, and we know that the term disciple, the word methetes, merely means learner, follower. It means whoever these men were who are called of the Lord in salvation were hungry men. They were students. And there is no Christian who isn't a student. Amen? All believers are students of God's Word. There is no Christian that is not hungry to learn. And so if you do not open your Bibles every day, if you do not consider the Word of God every day, it should be to your thinking, in your personal examination, have I known the Lord Jesus Christ? Because every Christian hungers for the Word of God. And even in their hours of weakness, they will run to the Word of God. They will go to the Word of God. And so every believer is a learner. Every believer is a disciple. There are those who say that after conversion, you then have to become a disciple. That's not the case. Being a disciple is not a second level in our salvation. To be saved is to be a learner. And I'll tell you, it doesn't matter if you are a pastor or a man of experience for 40 years, have gone through seminary, has gone through the Masters of Divinity and graduated in doctorate in theology. It doesn't matter. We are all disciples being trained until the final day of glory. No man has graduated being a disciple of Christ. And even after the Lord had ascended, even the twelve apostles were still being discipled of the Lord's Holy Spirit. But this is the state that they were in, of course. They are learners. And now, in verse 2, they are apostolos. They are sent messengers. They are His sent which gives us insight to the direction of the call that the Lord has for us as Christians. We are converted and made learners then to be sent as messengers. It never stops. We always grow in Christ. And so there is no converted man that should stay at a state of, in a state of idleness. The direction of the Christian call is meant to lead us into the world to proclaim what we have learned. Amen? And that's what the Lord Jesus said in one of His parables, did He not? He said about having treasure. The man who had treasure internally is a man who is willing to give out his treasures. And this is why it is not amazing, and you should not be amazed at men who just merely know. Knowledge is nothing if it does not lead a man to properly demonstrate that given knowledge in service. It means nothing. 
The Lord Jesus was not just wisdom. He was not just knowledge. He was servant. And so the disciples should be not just learners, not just knowledge, but servants unto others. And so we are learners prepared to be sent. And this is the very purpose of discipleship. If you ask yourself, what is the purpose of discipleship? Well, the purpose of discipleship is to train so that you may make disciples. And Jesus said in Matthew 28, make disciples, teaching them to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that they too may go out into all of the world. The purpose of discipleship is not just to store a bunch of people in a church building but so that they may go out. You can have a lot of people in one place, but if none of them are disciples, it means absolutely nothing. And now I'm not asking you to look at your neighbor, I'm asking you to consider yourself. What is the purpose of pastor teaching us? What is the purpose of us being discipled? What is the purpose of Christ calling me? Now, I'm not asking you to go out and think deeply. Maybe He's calling me to be a prophet. Maybe He's calling me to be an apostle. Maybe He's calling me to be a pastor one day. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to be found in the will of God and see the order of your call, which is to all of us, service. And He will make it clear exactly where you are going to be positioned. But you must have a heart of a servant. And so that's the direction we see. Learner to apostolos. The sent. So discipleship is to be equipped and then to be deployed. To be equipped and to be uh, deployed. And you know the beautiful thing about learning scripture is that we are told that's what Scripture is meant to do. Remember when Paul spoke to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. He said to him that all Scripture is breathed out by God. And what did he say? Profitable. Profitable for what? For teaching. For reproof. For correction. And for training in righteousness. Right? The man of God. So what? That the man of God may be equipped for every good work. And what I love about that text is that it says that he may be complete. Whenever we are being taught of the Lord's words, whether we go into Scripture or hear a preacher speaking of the Word of God, it is to make us complete. You see? And so you have all of these strategies in churches today where there is an activity of, okay, this is our worship group where we study worship. And then there's another day where, okay, this is where we study discipleship. But you see, the Word of God is complete in the sense that no matter what we are saying, found in the counsel of God, it will bring all of those things together. It is not unbalanced. It is complete. It teaches us not only the depths of worship, the heart of worship. It teaches us not only the glories of the gospel, but it also teaches us to be equipped, preparing us for our deployment in the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is complete. And so it deepens our knowledge of God our heart of compassion, yet our heart and willingness to serve and be deployed. And so, it gives us, the Word of God, courage to stand before the lost. It gives us wisdom in what to say to the lost. And it gives us hope in God for the lost. That's why we seek to learn. And you see, many people want to evangelize, but they don't want to be discipled. They don't want to be committed. 
and you don't understand how many people I've spoken to outside of this church who said, Pastor, what can you advise me in my style of preaching to others? Be discipled. What does that mean? Be committed to a church. Be under a pastor. Be found willing to humble yourself and submit yourself to the teaching of God's under-shepherd. Where He will watch over your soul, keep you accountable or accounted for. Where you are trained. So don't be surprised when you're unequipped in the world. And don't be surprised when you learn of Matthew 9, of the compassion of Christ for the lost, and your loved ones are dying, and there you are not willing to be discipled. That's the problem. We want all of these things to be done, but we do not want to be taught ourselves. And that's why there's an order here. Conversion genuinely leads to a man being a learner and then led to be sent by God. You can't jump the Lord's order here and become a laborer in His vineyard without being trained. And you cannot be trained. It all goes down the drain if you're not converted. But in hearing the Lord Jesus and in being taught of the Lord Jesus, we are being given all of these things since the Word of God makes us complete. It teaches us His character, His nature, that we ought to imitate. And these qualities rather come naturally than forced. It may seem forced as people hear this and say, well, see, that's what I have to do. I have to copy Jesus. It'll come naturally as a working of His Holy Spirit. As we continue to hear from Him, we will see like Him, have a heart like Him, think like Him, and walk like Him. And so, for those of you who have been saved, your hearing of the Master's words, even now, are preparing you to be sent. To be sent. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that you must treasure every word that you are hearing then. Every word you hear, treasure. Unless you have such a great memory, I encourage you to really remember these words. The Holy Spirit is faithful to remind us of these truths. But don't take these words for granted. Remember, every word is appointed by God that you may eat of and receive. It is meant to equip you and prepare you for the harvest. Now, as I've said earlier, this commissioning here is not the final commission where Jesus says, Okay, I'm gone now. I'm ascending into heaven. We know that's later on in Matthew 28. But this is a commission while he is training them on the earth while he's still with them. And so they were not removed under the very command of Christ. They were not um, to be by themselves anymore. Uh, Mark 6, 7 actually tells us that they were um, ordered two by two to go out. Which means they were not ready to be alone. And we better believe that the Lord Jesus was watching over them very diligently. He was supervising their training their internship, if you will. He was looking and observing how they spoke to the people, how they confronted the powers of darkness, how they would utilize what they've learned from His demonstration, His example. And you see, that's what the true teacher does. And I'm referring to Christ. He not only teaches, but He demonstrates and he demonstrates in his life and his joy is to see that very well done in the life of others. That they bear fruit in that way. That they too would imitate him. That they too would walk as he walked. And that he would, they would confront the powers of darkness in the same way that he did. Of course, all bearing his authority and not their own. And you know what amazes me? in the calling of, this, of, of these 12 here in verse 1, is how our Lord, in love, in wisdom, 
and in patience managed to train all of these 12 men. That is not an easy thing to do. Try being a pastor, you'll know. Or just try being a mother or father, you'll know. What it's like to take care of children, what it's like to take care of people. In the hospitals, doctors take care of patients, nurses take care of patients, and there is the fatigue because so many people to take care of. But in the context of the church, in the context of the believer, you are taking care of eternal souls. And what amazes me is that in Matthew 10, he calls them and makes it official they're being sent out. But in this very, at this very section of the synoptic narratives, these men were not perfect. They were far from perfect. They were not even close to being eloquent or wise. They had a lot of trouble. And what I'm getting at is when now entering that subject matter, I'd like you to examine yourself when it comes to the subject of discipleship. As the one being discipled and as the one discipling others. Really, the, the point of my teaching this morning is so that we can see Jesus' heart in calling his twelve. Some may read this and see, Pastor, they were called to cast out devils and heal sicknesses of every kind. These men were powerful. Well, it's not about them. It's about Christ who called them and the type of patience and wisdom and love he had while training them for three years. Ministry is not easy, brethren. Discipling people is not easy. It's not easy. We always desire the easy route where we want disciples coming and uh, growing and being born and made perfect instantly. But discipleship is not easy. If you are called to lead and to take care of people, oh, you might say, Pastor, am I called to lead people? I'm not a pastor. Doesn't mean you're not called to lead people. Are you a mother? Yes. Are you a father? You're called to lead people. You're called to lead your children. How many parents have forsaken leading their children? How many parents have forsaken leading their own sons and daughters to point them to Christ? You are called to lead as Christ has led you. You don't need to be a pastor to do that. And aside from leading your family, you're also called to lead the lost to Christ in the Great Commission. And so you can't, ex you can't escape it. You are called to disciple others and be discipled. But you're going to have to understand that it takes the love of Christ, the wisdom of Christ, and the patience of Christ to do it. Otherwise, you're going to quit. And you're not going to want to continue. You know how many times I read, I'm reading through the Gospels and I just think to myself, how could the Lord stay so patient? With these men, they were a troubled group. And that's what amazes me about the Lord Jesus here. He calls these 12 troubled men. And look at this, okay? When you consider Matthew 9, the end, Jesus has compassion over them. Pray to the Lord that he may send laborers. What is he stirring in their hearts? Have compassion for the people. Have compassion for the people. And so now they see, the disciples are looking at the crowds and they have eyes of compassion. Now what, Lord? The problem is, who is sufficient for these things? Who is able to be used of you, to be like you, and proclaim the good news to the lost? I can just imagine the twelve and, and them looking at each other. Peter Looking to him, uh, saying to himself, I'm 
not worthy to be called of God. James and John, those prideful brothers, absolutely not. How could they be possibly called of God? We're talking about winning the world, evangelizing the world. And these are the men that God has chosen in Christ. And so it teaches us that these 12 men, as they are named in verse 2 to 4, were not commissioned because they were perfect or even close to perfection. But all the way through, despite who they were, as chosen by God, the Lord Jesus trained them all the way until His ascension. Think about, think about the patience of the Lord. And then we, as disciplers, complain. Why don't the people have a desire like mine? Why don't they have the zeal like mine? Why don't they understand just yet? Why are they not willing to go out to be bold and courageous? Why are they still lacking despite the amount of time we've had with them? And then we begin to go into other pockets of discussion to find the reasons as to why they're like that. Now that's what we need to avoid. For the Lord Jesus dealt with these men for three years and He indeed Himself was the Lord and they still could not understand Him. Lacked in so many areas. But here we are when we are discipling others and we give up. It really we do when we begin to complain and wonder why after all these teachings and all these times that we've been together, they have not yet learned. But yet they are the ones who keep following. And then we expect them to be ready on their own. It's just like that after our teaching. That's not it. And that's why the preacher's heart is always, must always be in prayer. Must always express itself to God every time the word is given. Because as that man prepares to feed the sheep of God, he understands that it's not going to be instant result as he proclaims that word. He understands that it's going to take time like a faithful farmer, right? Watering, planting, God doing the increase. And so he must fight his own passions. He must fight his own ambitions, his own goals for himself. He must trust that when he proclaims the word of God, that God is faithful to bear fruit in the lives of those he has given him to take care of. No matter how long that might be or how long that might take. Remember our Lord in love, in wisdom, and in patience trained His disciples for three years. And who were they? They were men of opposite backgrounds. What do I mean? These men that He put together, there's no way they could be united. And we're reading their ministry as though these guys just loved each other. No, they, they had their difficulties. And really, if you were to think about a divided church, these disciples at this point in time could very well be those people. Who could be the best one out of us all? Who could reign with Him at His throne? Who uh, could be used of Him one day when He leaves? All of that is found in the Gospels, all the way up to His ascension. And so we might say to the Lord, why these men? Why them? Well, we've already eliminated the fact that it was because of their potential. Well, how many preachers ordained pastors because of potential. You are no different than a businessman who 
sees the potential of a man who could become big in the company. That's not how the Lord works. Our Lord is sovereign. He chooses as He wills. Whether that man has an ability or not, many of the times He chooses those who have nothing. And so I've heard before, choose the one who has potential. Choose the one who has a speaking ability. Choose the one who has learned theology. The other month I was speaking to a pastor who told me, and every time I have the t uh, moment to speak with this man, I always remind him that it is good to desire many elders, but to make sure that they are called of God. Because what they have been doing is mass producing elders. And so he said that the man that they chose last month to be at the pulpit was a man who graduated seminary and was great in theology. But a month later, he tells me his burden. And his burden is this, that church of a hundred people is now left to ten, not because of heresy, but because this man was just all about theology and not caring and tending to the souls of the people. The people were complaining that they were not being well fed. They were just being fed knowledge. And so I, I'm, my point is that we are not called because of anything we've done. We are not called to ministry because we're smart, we're wise, we've studied commentaries, we've studied the Greek, we've studied the Hebrew. We are called by God purely of His grace and nothing more. And the example of these disciples show that. They are fishermen who had nothing in their belts. Nothing to boast about. But by the Holy Spirit used of Him mightily. And so their calling is not because they are skillful men. And neither did our Lord say, who wants to be my apostles? Lift your hand. None of them lifted their hands. None of them. And neither was that the reason why he called them. They were sovereignly chosen. They were sovereignly chosen. Read with me Mark 3, please. Mark chapter 3. Are you still with me? Mark chapter 3. And remember what I said earlier, when you are looking at the ministry of Jesus and his relationship with his disciples, I'd like you to see yourself as you are indeed, if called by him, his disciples as well. Now look at verse 13, just one verse. And he went up to the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Um, <clears throat> In Luke chapter 6, he prayed all night and he called out from his disciples 12, which is to imply there were many followers that day, but he chose 12 of them out of the crowd. That's it. It leaves us with just that thought. He called them purely because he chose them. They were the ones that the Father gave that's it. And he recognized in prayer all night who the Father gave him. They were the chosen, those foreordained before the foundation of the world. Isn't it amazing that Peter and the rest of them were called of him because they were those ordained men from eternity past? Hear the words of John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I cho chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. You see? You didn't choose Christ. Christ chose you. And what for what? That you may bear fruit. How faithful is our Lord. And then, before his arrest in John 17, what did Jesus say? He confirms this. 
Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. It is not because of anything in them. The Father had set them for the purpose of the kingdom. These difficult men were chosen by God, yes. Yes. Just as He has chosen you. Just as He has chosen you in your salvation. Not because of anything you have in yourself. Dead in your sins and trespasses, He has chosen you. For what? That you may go and bear fruit. And has set you apart for himself. Now, that's interesting. God would call if difficult men unto himself. And what difficulties do we see? Now, we're going to have a little different approach here. Because last time in Luke 6, we went name by name. But really, you can see in summary, as you do an overview of the Gospels, the characteristics of these twelve. And the first problem we have with them is that they lacked spiritual comprehension. They were not the wisest. Really, they would be considered fools. But they lacked spiritual understanding. They couldn't understand His parables many of the times. They often asked Him, Lord, what do you mean? In Matthew 15, when the Lord gave a parable, they asked, Could you teach us what this parable means? Explain to us. And what did our Lord respond? Are you still also without understanding? Many times in the Gospels, we will read of the Lord asking, Do you understand this? When Philip was talking to the eunuch and he saw him reading the scripture, what did he say? Do you understand what you're reading? They were always listening, but they were not always comprehending. Often they were not comprehending. In John 13, 7, he says, What I am doing you do not understand now. But afterward, you will understand. In Luke 18, when our Lord told them for the third time, He tells them multiple times, giving them little hints of His soon coming death. And now we are at the third time He describes His death. And then in verse 34 of Luke 18, after He had explained to them, what, is, what does it say there? But they understood none of these things. How could that be? They've been with him for three years. And they're nearing his arrest. And until that point, they still couldn't understand. And yet these were the scent of Matthew 10. Again, the lesson I'm trying to convey is the point of view of the discipler and the one who is being discipled. Now, do you ever read that the Lord, despite their lack of understanding, ever said, forget it, you guys are useless. I'm going to find someone else. Well, how many times we hear that in ministry, right? I'm moving on to someone else. You guys are useless. But yet, they are the ones that God is bringing to hear. And so instead of turning away from them, what does he do? He continually teaches them. Wow. The Lord had patience. And the Lord in love, in wisdom, and in patience, every time they could not understand, did he say to Peter, Peter, I'm not going to teach you anymore. No, Jesus explained, explained, explained. Always willing to teach.
He taught them, and he taught them, and he taught them. And guess what? After he rose again from the dead in Acts chapter 1, what did he do there? He taught them for 40 days while he remained with them. He still taught them. And even now, by His Holy Spirit, He is teaching us over and over and over again. What, what is the example that we ought to see from this? Well, the discipler should never get tired of teaching His disciples. Amen? A discipler should never get tired of teaching. No matter how hard it is to study, no matter how many hours you put into it, no matter how many tears you've shed and how many hours of prayer you've prayed, you should never get tired of teaching those people even if there's only three of them left. You always must pray to God that He would give you a heart like Christ to, to always teach out of your compassion for the people. The discipler never gets tired of teaching. And what does this teach us from the point of view of the disciple? The disciple should never get tired of learning. And so see to it that you desire to always be taught by the Lord Jesus Christ. And if the Lord places you at a time in your life where you may disciple another... Never get tired of teaching the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they lacked spiritual understanding. What else was their problem? Well, the disciples were also prideful. They were a prideful men, a people. Now, who was in the group? Well, Matthew. Matthew was a part of the group, and we know Matthew is what? A tax collector. Which means what? A tax collector was practically friends with the Roman government because the Roman government gave them what they wanted and they were the wealthy of, of all the Jews because of the fact that they were working for the government. But aside from Matthew, who else was in the group? Simon the Zealot, who wanted to murder the Romans. Two men of two different political views coming together and being called of the Lord Jesus to be one. How is that going to be possible? They were prideful men. And I'm sure, though it was not recorded, these men must have had conversations deeply of what they had valued internally. But of course, coming to Christ, they had set aside all of those vain things. And they've come united to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like the church, right? Different beliefs, different point of views, different thoughts of whatever. But gathering together around Christ who is our Lord and Master who has called us to be one as He is one with the Father. So they are a prideful bunch. And aside from these, the brothers who came in, obviously in pairs, and they were competing with one another. Who will be the greatest duo of Christ followers? Remember Matthew 20, when James and John's mother came to the Lord and requested, Could my boys please be rulers by your side? And what did the tens, how did they respond when they heard? The scripture says they were indignant. They were angry. How dare you go behind our backs and say that and ask to be greater than us? And the Lord rebukes them. The Gentiles seek to be rulers and lords, but he who is greater among you is your servant. Turn with me, Mark 9, please. Mark chapter 9. You want to see how troubled these men are? Mark 9. Now, verse 33, please. 
The scripture says, And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued, see, with one another about who was the greatest. They are prideful and envious men. Verse 35, And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Amen? <clears throat> and so how did our Lord deal with such prideful men? When they lack understanding, what did he do? He dealt by teaching them continually. And now how does he deal with their pride? He gave them examples of himself. He gave them the demonstration of his own humility. Remember the words I quoted earlier in John 13, 14, and 15. He says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, right? How do you deal with pride? Look at Jesus Christ, who was a servant. How can a man claim to be of Christ and desire to rule over men? When they look to Jesus, they see nothing but servanthood and humility. And his humility was all, always seen all the way to the cross. Servanthood. And so you look at Jesus. That's the way he dealt with their pride. So as a discipler, you have the example of humility. But as fallen or as weak men, under shepherds even, who are weak men, they still point to the ultimate example in Christ, His humility. So as disciples, we point to Jesus' humility. And as disciples, we seek to look at Christ. Next, they were not only prideful men, but they were faithless men. They were disciples who had great unbelief. How many times have we read Jesus asking them, where is your faith? Are you still of little faith? Even all the way to his uh, resurrection, there would still be this great unbelief among them. Thomas doubted Christ. He wouldn't believe until he saw Jesus face to face. But many of the disciples doubted the words of the woman who saw him resurrect or be raised from the dead. Look at Mark 16 and, and look at the words there. Mark chapter 16 verse 14. Mark 16 14. What does it say? Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And then he gives them the commission to go out into the world and preach. Despite the word that he has risen, they were still in unbelief. Yet out of his patience, he dealt with their unbelief by what? Displaying his power to prove that he is who he says he is. Many times in the gospel, he performed miracles. And many times it wasn't just for the crowds. It was really for his disciples to see that they may see for themselves that if they are to be messengers into the world, that they 
are not serving a dead Christ or a vain Christ, but the real Christ. And even after he died, he proved his power by showing them his risen body. And so he dealt with their unbelief by encouraging them, by proving. Even at, in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 3, at his ascension, before, sorry, moments before his ascension, Scripture says that he presented himself alive to them after suffering many, many proofs. He showed them the evidences of his resurrection. So even up till that point, these men were weak. And when it came to the hour of their trials, their faith was greatly shaken and their confidence in the one they followed for three years was nowhere to be found. Which led to what? Which is my last point this morning, is not only were they lacking faith, but they were also uncommitted. What do you mean? They were with him for three years. Yes, but when it came to the hour of great threatenings and trials, these men scattered and were gone. Do you remember Peter? At the hour of Jesus' trial, when they asked him, Aren't you of Jesus? And what does Peter say? No, he was quick to deny Quick to deny. And how did Jesus deal as the discipler? How did he deal with their uncommittedness? He prayed for them. He prayed for them. Luke 22, please. Luke 22. And specifically with regards to Peter's denial. Luke twenty two thirty one, and look at the love of our teacher, Simon. Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. You see, and when you have turned again, strengthen. Your brothers. How does the Lord as the discipler deal with the uncommittedness of his disciples? He prays for them. Just like what every good teacher should do. He does not just teach and demonstrate his wisdom. But in private, that's where he does the pouring out of his heart for these people. Most of the times all you will see is a man speaking before you. But the man called of God will be there speaking to God countless hours, pouring his heart out for the people he will be speaking the word of God to. Jesus prayed that their faith would not fail. So out of his love, out of his wisdom, and out of his patience, he dealt with with their spiritual lacking, their lacking of spiritual comprehension by teaching them. He dealt with their pride by demonstrating his own humility. He dealt with their unbelief by displaying his power. He dealt with their uncommittedness by praying for them. Christ did not make a mistake when he chose this twelve. He knew how difficult it was going to be to manage these 12 and eventually send them out as he would ascend to heaven as the 12 apostles who would practically be, aside from Christ, the foundations and pillars of the New Testament church. He didn't just call them. The Lord Jesus managed them and was and loved them and in his wisdom taught them and in his patience bared their difficulties
that's what we should see in Matthew chapter 10 before you go over and start reading verse 5. There's a reason why they're named here. Just so we know that these were not perfect men. Just so you know, whenever you become like Jeremiah and you wonder, Lord, why am I, why am I the one you're sending? I am but a young man. I don't have the right words. If God has saved you, he has, it is because He has chosen you. And He has chosen you to bear fruit. He has not made a mistake in that. No matter how weak you are and how inadequate you are, that's a good thing because He will show forth His glory in your life as He sanctifies you and matures you unto Himself. To confound the wise, right? And to exalt those who are without. And what does He do? Well, they were not only all of those things described earlier, but they were also powerless men. This is why in verse 1, they are given power, authority. What does that mean? Authority like His? No, authority to bear His power and to rightfully exercise it over the powers of darkness. And these difficult men later on in the book of Acts in chapter 4 would be those that the Jews looked upon. And what does the scripture say? They were astonished. Why? Because these were common and uneducated men. That's a work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything that we bear in fruit, every fruit that we bear rather, is a result of His great leadership, His great shepherding, His teaching of His Word to us. And so the qualities that you might see in yourself or others, don't bring the glory to your own self. It's not because of you. It's because of what the Lord Jesus has done. And Paul says it this way later on in his epistle, that He who has gone ahead before us may bear much fruit or may bear and reap the fruit that he left off. And until now, the Lord is reaping the works that he has done, the teachings that he has left, and all the fruit that we bear it goes unto him, the glory. We are but just messengers who repeat the same teaching of Christ. We are but messengers who repeat that very truth that he had proclaimed for us. And so the increase is to his glory, to his name. And so what love then, as we look, into our, look to ourselves and see the fruit, what love the Lord has for us, what wisdom the Lord has, and what patience He has toward us. We should identify ourselves with those men. How faithful is He to equip us despite our lacking But the faithful Lord has called us, called you, and He is continually washing you by His Word. That you may know in His example servanthood, which you and I ought to follow. And so our heart cries, Lord, there are so many that are lost. There are so many that are lost. But who is sufficient for these things? How could Peter, how could Matthew, how could... Simon, the zealot, how could they confront the world and proclaim the gospel of salvation? Seeing that the harvest is coming. Oh, but Christ, our master, is faithful. He will teach us, amen? He will teach us. He is teaching us. He will demonstrate His power time and time again before us. In the things that we've read and in ver with our very own eyes, we will see His power. He will show us His humility. And even now is praying for us. If I may just turn to John 17 and just read these things to you. You don't need to turn there, but I want you to listen to these words of the Lord in John 17. 
He says in verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. And so he who has called you is preparing you to be sent, to be sent. And may he give us ears to hear his instructions. You might be battling those thoughts. I am weak, I am unable. Yes, you are. But Christ is our faithful teacher. Run after him. Learn of him. What did he say to the woman who followed him? Learn of me. Not just his teachings, but his life. Look to his life and pattern his life. And he will mold you, he will teach you, and he will call you and send you out into the world. And that so when men and women see you, they do not see you, they see Christ, the glory of the Heavenly Father. Oh, may he give us ears to hear his instructions. You have to be back next week to hear them. But he is faithful. He who has called you, is faithful. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the words you have imparted to us by your Holy Spirit. How encouraging it is, Lord, for the disciples to have been taught by you and yet to have been encouraged by you to hear the words that you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Oh, the same words you say to us now. In the hours of our limitations, in the hours of weakness, when we doubt even our own abilities, certainly it is good that we see our weaknesses, that we may glory in your strength and your faithfulness. May we, O oh Lord, follow after the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, who in love and in wisdom and in patience taught his disciples, and even now by the Holy Spirit is teaching us. You are faithful, and all the fruit that we bear is to your glory. And we pray that you teach us continually, O oh Master, that we would have ears to receive wise counsel, and even as disciplers, Father, that we would not lose patience, that we would not stop teaching, but that we would always see to it to feed the sheep of God out of our love for you, that we would always seek your face for wisdom and look at your example of patience when you had patience greatly for us enduring our shame, enduring our sins. On that cross, you died for us. Teach us then, O Lord, as those called by you to look upon the world in compassion and to obey you as you have sent us out to proclaim the good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.